Welcome to The Great Security Debate. This show has experts taking sides to help broaden understanding of a topic. Therefore, it's safe to say that the views expressed are not necessarily those of the people we work with or for. Heck, they may not even represent our own views as we take a position for the sake of the debate. Our website is greatsecuritydebate.net, and you can contact us via email at feedback at greatsecuritydebate.net or on Twitter at securitydebate. Now, let's join the debate already in progress. One thing I was just thinking of on when I was looking at like cybersecurity hot trends of 2023, and some of these, I whether I agree or disagree, one of them was the demand for cyber insurance is going to increase, but it's going to become harder to get. But on top of that, so I think we were spot on in 2021 going into 2022 when we said cyber insurance, you know, for better or worse, was actually going to help drive some of the advantages or initiatives from executives to be able to push for more, right? Which it definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. But now that you're seeing companies actually back off, when I say companies, insurance companies back off and say they might get out of the business, right? Mm -hmm. Or putting so much in there that it becomes very, very hard to be able to cash in on it because now you're going to be even spending more and more and more from a forensics trying to prove that that's not the case, right? Right. Well, Um, if you look at, so I just, I just dropped a link in the, the chat. This is something I sent over to our risk team that there was a quote from the CEO yeah. of Zurich yeah. that's saying that cyber is going to be uninsurable going forward. Well, yeah. And I think, well, the, um, well, from one of two reasons, the, the response I get back from risk is almost like, well, good luck. Well, let, We're counting. Well, on let, you. Let's change the word uninsurable to unprofitable. And I think you've yeah. got the real answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> The yeah, it's so yeah. So to having just finished a uh, an insurance renewal, um, it, it's a really interesting time in this. There's not a lot of um. There's a lot of questions, a lot of a lot of introspection, a lot of detail of some very specific parochial things, and this is what we've talked about, you know, for years. I'll and I'll point to a bunch of episodes that um you know that we've talked about insurance and and the uh, yeah, link here. Um, it was, so this episode, we've so. talked about, you know, fears about insurance driving particular technologies, um, but insurance definitely driving behaviors. And I can tell you that the things that are missing in your portfolio, but are on the list of questions that come from the insurers definitely makes a difference because the specter of not being able to be insured meaning you are uninsurable. Let's not talk about the field or this whole top, this whole insurance area yet. Let's just talk about your organization, the specter of potentially being uninsurable um, in this space now has come to take in this, it's become this piece where if you don't have this particular insurance, you can't do business. You've got customers that are demanding it. It's becoming like, general liability or automotive insurance is built in so well. So what's really interesting is this pivot around to say, well, we made it. We know we made you all really think you needed this and you had it. And some of you, by the way, un- inappropriately shifted all your risk to the insurance company instead of actually fixing things. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute, but now we're going to, we're going to Lucy the football out and 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 make you kick at air again because guess what we made you think you needed it and now it's not profitable for us so we're going to get the heck out of the business um it's a really interesting state of affairs uh, but as of right now it's still a mandate it's still a customer demand in most cases um it's getting more expensive there's tons of carve outs and it's going to be a nightmare for a little while and so you have to expect just like the homeowner's insurance with a pre with a um with a uh, with an excess claim. that you can't, you know, you're like, well, if I if I uh, if I do this, this this thing, ah, uh, if I do the excess, then it's going to cost me more. So I might as well just pay it cash. So I have insurance. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to use it or intend to use it or can use it for the thing when it happens. Wait, are you saying you're incentivized to keep it quiet? What? No, not keep it quiet. Oh no, 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 not to use insurance to pay back the expenses. There's a difference. Yeah. One is fiscal. <clears throat> one is ethical. I, I I'll tell you what I mean I 
two different sides of the coin, right? You have the, the business side of it, looking at to offset risk that we can cap it because we know that out of pocket, we're only going to expend X. Insurance will come in and make us whole for everything net above that to a certain point, right? So I, I get that. But from the practitioner side, I'm still maintaining that that insurance, if it does go away, is a positive. I see this very much like, and I'm going to take a shot at big four accounting that have done the external, been the external auditor for many of our firms that we've had to argue with, um, whether it be password length versus complexity versus how long you have to reset passwords and all of these. As we look at security, our control sets and mindsets are changing so rapidly that it's very hard for some of the bigger organizations that are trying to to more to build frameworks that they can apply to all of these different organizations that they're working with. It's hard for them to adapt to the changes in security. And I see this with insurance again, that if they, and they have in certain cases started to dictate certain technologies, but in some cases started to push certain vendors within a technology state that it ignores all of the changes that are coming within each of those security verticals, right? You know, Brian, I mean, you work for one of those disruptors right now. Now, granted, they've been around for, for a little bit, but they're disrupting the email space. So if we were to go back to a list that said, hey, you have to pick from one of these email providers, Abnormal is probably not going to be on that list. Maybe it is now, but if we go back a year, they weren't on that list. And that's doing a disservice to the organization that's trying to protect themselves because you guys very likely have one of the best solutions out there. Well, replace no, the word I Abnormal with with you know a new groundbreaking drug and you've got the exact same thing you know let's yeah. dictate yeah. therapies uh even though we're not you know we're positioned to dictate therapies because they're good for us and we can make good deals on them uh not because they're necessarily the right thing for the patient god forbid the doctor be the one that decides because they went to med school like in, in your spot on there eric and not not necessarily about the abnormal piece which i appreciate but go back and look at you know, where I previously worked in the EDR space and how insurance drove EDR from a forensic side. What is EDR, and, and Brian? Oh, sorry. Endpoint detection and response. Strictly because from a forensic standpoint, it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when a company got breached. And when that happened, the insurance companies have to come in with a DFIR team, right? So your forensics incident response teams. And when they come in, if there's no forensics information, right? An endpoint detection and response is strictly gathering all this log information from a forensic standpoint, putting it in order so you can understand what happened, when it happened, and how do you fix the problem and remediate it? So many companies did not have this. At the time, if you go back to 2019 and before, less than 10% of North America was truly using an EDR. Companies were selling you know, standalone antivirus products with it on there. But what the insurance companies realized was this is happening at an exponential rate. And it takes us longer if companies don't have this, like we can send in. And it's one of the reasons why you look at FireEye, why they split their business model, right? And they realized that there's FireEye, the product side, right? And then there's Mandiant, Mandiant, the IR company. Mandiant splitting right. from them was on the basis of, Okay, we're gonna we're gonna redesign our tool set to use anybody's EDR because now people are starting to adapt EDRs and it's not FireEye. And if we go into this forensics investigation, we have to redeploy. And insurance companies are pushing everybody to have EDR, and now they're making it mandatory. It's on right? the back list, in, yeah, yeah. Back into the end of 2021, we said it was coming, right? Like in order to get cyber insurance, you have to have an EDR, and then it became, and, and this is. Uh, how do I state this as clearly as possible? Insurance companies pushed what IR companies you worked with. So IR companies right. were backing. So incident response companies were backing the different insurance companies. They were placating in, in, in basically lobbying, like use us, use us because of the business. It was just yeah. increasing exponential. There were small IR companies that grew to behemoths in three years, right? And those companies push, you know, that that's where the EDR companies were grabbing hold of different IR companies instead of response companies and say, use us, use us. Right. So and there was a trickle down bought benefit. CVS. I mean, there's so many parallels here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to step off my one soapbox and move to the other since we're supposed to do this debate <laughs> style, right? <laughs> move to the, move to the other side of the coin. Cause if you think about this though, in the absence of dictating some sense of list of players that are approved in the space EDR, I'm actually going to go to the pen testing space. 
because I have seen with some outside work that I, I've done that there are so many firms out there that say, hey, you're going to get a pen test. All you'll do here, pay this fee. We're going to give you an executable. You're going to run it in your environment. We're going to give you a report. And that's called a pen test. Yeah. Yes. That's or not no. a pen test. Yeah. That's you, yeah, and at best. We're talking about it's a vulnerability scan. Right. So when you start to get into insurance and those nuances that it allows organizations to say, well, you said I needed an EDR. So I picked Bob's EDR that this guy down the street created. And I ran it. I checked the box. Why doesn't that right. count? Right. And that's I think that's the issue that. Uh, where we were hopeful that insurance would help drive the ability for security leaders to be able to push for more to get more budget. It did. But. In, in an effort to be able to get the cyber insurance and do things quickly and so forth, a lot of organizations from a check the box, when you were just talking about Bob's EDR, Phil's EDR, it, it reminds me of the marijuana industry in Michigan, right? And, which has nothing to do with cyber security. But if you wanted to get your marijuana tested, there was a million Where companies that did the testing. It was like, do you give higher percentages of THC just by me paying you a little more money? I mean, no, but maybe, Right. And it's like there was no regulation. So companies would come in. There was a million different testing companies for it, but they were giving false information out there, just not great information. So you saw this, this generation of, of EDR companies just started to rise. There, there was the companies yeah. that had been around for a while, and then everybody was jumping into EDR, oh, right? It's the same thing same thing you had in the, the vitamin market and all of that. Oh, yeah, it's been tested by so-and-so. Right. It means nothing, so, okay? So I, I guess then pivoting backwards on this. So you saw the increase that um, cyber insurance, both from a cost standpoint, but also from the idea that, or not the idea, but it actually pushed organizations that they have to focus on, hey, we need to have X, Y, and Z. There was a little bit of the check the box, but not necessarily just checking the box. You actually had to go through the information now in 2022, if you were going to get a renewal or a policy and really prove out that, yes, we did this. Yes, we did this, right? And the larger right. the organization, the more information they had to be forthcoming, right? Mm -hmm. And this this is where I go back to where you were heading earlier, Brian, when you were talking about that you have, an, you have a firm come, a forensics firm come in and they need a certain level of transparency and data in order to do their job, right? And this is one of the things that I think that as we talk about it, put this in the context of frameworks that I think PCI got right. The PCI was less about that you have to have all these tools. Now there is some of that prescriptive nature in there, but it was, you have to retain it for one year and these are all the different things around the CDE that you must log, you must retain, and you have to have it to this level. So it didn't matter what tool, as long as you're creating that paper trail or that digital trail of what was going on in the environment that we could back into what happened, you're good to go. Well, the interesting- And I think that's where we need The to interesting head. difference here though is, you know, back the, uh, so unlike health, the, there is the, again, a specter that's, that, that is used in this, and it's the threat of non-payment. It's the, you know, buy insurance, do these things, get your Bob's EDR. But when you need to pay out, we're going to look. And after your incident, we may decide that you that you lied on your insurance. You may decide that you, you know, did not get a sufficient, and it's solely up to us, us being the insurance companies, so that that acts as a bit of a um, of a stick to go along with the carrot of a, right. a, a payment, and I think that part actually is working better now. The through the fact that insurance companies have had numbers of cases of you lied, and we're not paying, or you did insufficient, and you're not, and we're not paying. Those are going to start to encourage people to use better providers now the formulary list is still very much there in the ir and the um and the legal space but that's purely cost i don't think that's as much about quality i think it's absolutely about cost management um after the fact because that's a place a part of the process where the insurance company can co and does control um they want to do the billing they want to do volume they want to do those kinds of things just like they want to be the single payer when it comes to right. um, when it comes to buying medicines, it's the same. That that's where the where the, where the where the similarity comes. But in the pre side, you know, it's a we will insure you on the promise that you're doing it well enough, and we'll determine if right. you're doing it well enough after it's too late. So do it uh, right I, up front, which isn't a bad isn't a bad way to encourage risk. No, 
No, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, I would draw a parallel to what the SEC is doing. They're doing a similar thing that, hey, we're going to force you to be transparent about your controls, Mm -hmm. what you have from a governance standpoint, so that in the event that something happens and this is going to affect shareholders, I'm going to take this sheet and I'm going to run you through it that were you actually doing the things that you said you were doing? And if you're not, we're going to hold you accountable. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I I was just pulling up information as you guys were talking. Um, it's the three different examples of where a cyber insurance claim was denied. Um, and one of them actually follows that whole failure to maintain. So when it says like avoid the most common cyber insurance claim denials, right? And the first one being failure to maintain. Mm-hmm. So you you go through, you get your cyber insurance, and you say we're doing this, 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 and this but you don't maintain those things. And they come in after a claim and can clearly show that you weren't maintaining the things that you said you were going to do. Eric, this goes right back to, and Dan, get ready for it. Automotive manufacturing. What? You walk through, yeah, you walk through your entire assembly process. You do your, your low volume production trial and your high volume production trial. And during that high volume production trial, when you're actually speeding up the line, you got your customer there and you're trying to show like all the pokey oaks, the quality controls and everything you put in, they work. But then as you get into the process, some of those things that you were doing during the high volume production trial, you were simply doing because you couldn't get to the volume you said you were going to do. But as you started to get better, you pulled out those controls because the process sped up. But some of those controls that you put in were quality controls for the time being. And you pulled those things out. You didn't maintain what you showed the customer you were going to do. Boom. Then you have a warranty issue, right? And it costs you a lot right. of money. It's the same thing here. You 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 get your cyber insurance, you, you get checked off the high volume production control, the high volume production trial, the customer comes in, checks off and says, you are good to go. We can begin production, right? And then all of a sudden a year later, boom, your, your manufacturing line shuts down. They come in and it's like, well, you weren't following this control and this one, the things that you said you were going to do right here, right? Like, you got to reinvest in all this stuff and, and you're spending the money to do it, right? The customer is not going to make a design change because it wasn't a design issue. It's not on them right. to do it. It's the same thing here. You don't maintain those things you said you were set out to do. And I think that becomes an even harder issue because Eric, like you said, if you put certain controls in place in 2019 and 2020, you could follow those same controls, right? That you were doing back then, but depending on what tools you were using, right? Or what things you were focused on. By 2023, 2024, those things have changed a little bit, right? And what you're trying to stop. I mean, you brought up abnormal. Business email compromise wasn't a big issue back in 2018, right? The the level of volume of social engineering attacks, it, it was big, but it wasn't like it is today. It's increased dramatically, right? Over the span of three, four years. I think it was big. So, I so think for it's- those that are only listening, Dan's face when Brian said that, I think we've got a disagreement coming. I, I think we have. I think we have a case of Brian. You had you been in a had you been a practitioner at that time, you'd know you would yeah, you would know there. that's absolutely not the case. Yes, it's gotten more sophisticated now, and I'm not going to litigate your product or or the, the, the no, space, no. but it's gotten way more sophisticated and way more way more. Um, Publicized, publicized now, but this has been going on for decades. Yeah, decades. and you know what? Some I, <laughs> you're probably right there in in the standpoint of if you look at numbers, right? Strictly from like what's submitted, and this goes back to ransomware as well, right? Like what's actually submitted, what's not, and how how from a government standpoint, an FBI standpoint, how fraud is now determined whether it's related to this, whether it's related to BC, or whether it's related to some other crime has probably gotten a lot better over the last three years. So now it shows a greater impact, right? So to your point, it could have been going on for years, but the way that now it's reported and the numbers are being shown, both from an institutional standpoint. But anyhow, <laughs> not talking about that, but pivoting back to the si- standpoint that things change, yeah. right, that you were doing. So to simply say that you weren't following or maintaining the practices that you said, if you're not doing Eric Genshik and Butsu and, and constantly improving, right, Right. The things that you were doing three years ago sometimes aren't aren't the same things that maybe you should be doing today. Now, not to say going back to basics, sorry. Yeah. But these models are built, and this is where you know this is where I'm 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 worried about this. We create these models that encourage checklist, uh, you know, checklists. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware, recently the European Union 
made a law, has nothing to do with security, made a law that all devices need to charge with this, a USB-C cable. Um, and that's great. USB-C is now a 10-year-old standard, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine-year-old standard. It's not new. It's that's been, cool. it, and they put it into law, the, the, the very specific approach and answer. In three years, it's very possible that this vehicle will now be outdated, but it's going to take 10 years to undo or reiterate on that law. law. So now we've got this, uh, bring this back into, into security, you've got a set of checklists that were created by formularies, created by actuaries, um, and say, do this, this, and this. And even in PCI, which is very fiscally funded, there is, there is there's a lag, and they are really active on it. There's a little bit of a lag between current best practice and what PCI requires. And granted, they've said, go you know do this or above, but they're also not taking your money every year. Well, I guess a little bit, right. but not in the same way that your insurance provider is. Um, but I want to, I want to swing it around to um, in a time of do more with less, does insurance get cut from organizations? Do, do people start to lie more about the insurance and take the risk of um of not getting a payout because they took control away or they you know stop buying this software service you know we're getting subscription fatigue inside organizations as much as uh you know we are with every tv service with a plus after their name um you know all of those kinds of things are really starting to weigh in and you know cash flow is shrinking companies are are looking for are for, for places to save. Is this right. one of those places uh, where you buy the insurance, but you don't put all the controls in, but you say you do, and you hope you just never need it. And this is, is so to answer your first question, I don't think insurance goes away because as you tied it, there's a lot of ancillary other insurance policies that require cyber to be in place or they won't even pay out. Right. So there's that interconnectedness right. of it. That, <laughs> hey, if you don't buy multiple of my multiple of my products, and just buy one. That one is no. We'll good. Sell, we won't sell you just the axles. See, I'm going to do an automotive reference. Yeah. We can't. If we won't sell you the axles. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, even worse. If you want that sunroof, you're also going to have to buy the nav that nobody really wants in their car because CarPlay will do it. Anyhow, yeah. I mean, or, or vice versa. <laughs> if, you, if you don't want the sunroof, it doesn't matter. If you buy the nav, you're getting the sunroof. Yeah. Yeah. So, so going back, so I, I like your USB C analogy because I, I think about this. And if I recall correctly, this was the whole premise on the argument of the law of the horse, right? That if we make a law that is so prescriptive that by the time it actually gets into reality and actually gets minted, that it is no longer relevant and the amount of time it takes to change it. So you need to back it up and make it broad enough to not only cover the horse and buggy, but also take into account technological changes down the road that might also govern a car or other yeah. things. And that's how we have to look at it from a security perspective. Because I, I think one of the things that I think we all, and we all, I'm talking about just businesses in general, regulators and everything struggle with, is that I think we still try to look at cyber risk from the lens of what we've had to traditionally, where we've grown up from the financial side. That as we look at what happened with Enron, that we got Sarbanes-Oxley, which gave us a bunch of controls. But if we look at, at finance and accounting, that is a very mature organization or very mature set of controls right. as we talk about GAP and then some others as you get internationally. But there's not a there's not a huge volume of nuances between the controls, the generally accepted controls that, that organizations have to have to be transparent. Yeah, we ferreted out most there. of the things to make GAP a, a reliable piece. And there's not hackers trying to get in or there's not a whole new right. set of people trying to. Well, I guess there's always somebody trying to fraudulently use There's somebody trying to yeah. game it. But what they did in some of those controls, they said, these are going to be your base controls. And then you have some discretionary stuff and how you can handle whether, you know, LIFO, FIFO, how you're doing some depreciation. There's little levers that you have as a business that you can pull to, to change how your organization, how it's financially structured. But by and large, it's very, very mature, very structured. And if we try to apply, apply those same set of ideals over to the cyber side, we're going to lose every time. It is way too nuanced. So to bring this back to where you're asking about the cyber insurance side, I think what it allows a lot of us to do that in times of big budgets and surplus, 
that is very easy to get lazy and throw technology at problems rather than being creative and solving actual business risk issues. I think this forces a lot of practitioners to draw back and actually have to start getting creative that, hey, I this here's the control, here's the way I read it. What's the actual intent? What is it trying to solve for? And more often than not, there are very economical ways that we can go about creating the same risk offset without spending a lot of dollars on a given technology. I'm just going to ask the question here, though. <clears throat> Do you think, though, that cyber insurance back in 2019, 2020, this whole rise in one having to have cyber insurance, because I, I can go back to when we had some of our first podcasts and discussions and I had had conversations with two very, very, very large companies. And one was a, a person that was a very close friend. And he said, honestly, Brian, he goes, our focus, and this was an automotive. He said, our focus is making sure every one of our suppliers just has cyber, or, sorry, from a risk management standpoint, they said, our focus to make sure all of our suppliers have cyber insurance. And I said, why is that? He goes, well, that will cover us from, from losses and so forth for downtime. And I said, I think that's a very bad direction and policy to focus yeah. on. He's like, but we can't dictate to our suppliers to increase their, their level of. But you of, can. Um, that's why God they, invented the contract. So they, they, they tried, <laughs> but, but the problem is, and Eric, you've probably seen this um, a little bit from, from your side as a, a very large tier one. A lot of these tier ones went back to that same OE and told them, Hey, we'll, we'll do the things you're asking for, but the price of our product is going to go up because our overhead is going to go up. Right. Like right. that's, that's what suppliers do. It's business, right? They're like, you're asking me to do these things. And the OE said, guys, it's the same thing we asked you to do in production control and quality. It's risk management. Right. So there was that back and forth time period, but two years later, boom, now the companies had to start doing those things even to get their cyber insurance. But what I'm going to ask is, do you think, cause I hear this a lot is that ransomware was the fear that drove people, especially in the manufacturing and healthcare to start saying, okay, we got to have cyber insurance. Cause I'm just worried about ransomware. You know, go I mean, two, three years. what was ransomware the driver? I think certainly it was, it was the topic du jour that everybody was afraid of. Um, but also, I mean, some of those, I think some of the, and uh, uh, some of the fun gets driven out of the sensationalization of headlines and since ransomware, no matter what the event was, I think it was still being called a ransomware event. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing that is you have companies that it was a sophisticated adversary. No, 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 you didn't pass. Yeah, that's code for I let my pass. I put a password on a sticky and lost it at the airport. Yeah, so it's it's hard to say. I mean, the actual numbers on how much of it is sensationalized just around hashtag ransomware versus something else. But I think the net result we can look at, sure. Cyber got driven up, but uh, you know, Brian, as you're talking about on the supply chain, sure, OE to tier one that thou shalt have cyber insurance. Cool. Try to cascade that down. It's only it's it's almost a semi-perfunctory control that sure you have the the tier one that's supplying you with material to make your vehicles, but what about everybody supplying the the tier one? And that's where the ecosystem gets so much bigger. And sorry. Those cyber controls, I'm, I'm forcing cyber insurance, you cannot cascade those down to smaller companies because they do not have the revenue stream to afford something like that, let alone even afford a full-time security guy or even sometimes even an IT person, right? It just doesn't scale all the but way down. isn't that a cost of doing business? So it... The ship. So let's go... I'm going to go back to something I said at the beginning, which is, you know, the end of insurance... For infosec and for you know for breaches, would then force the end of this default shift to insurance. To bring you know to Brian's point before, I just hope all my supply. I'm just holding them all to have insurance. Too many organizations, not just small ones, have shifted so much of their risk. Well, if I don't do this control, I just have insurance to cover it. Why do you think yeah. it's un? Why do you think it's unaffordable? Why do you think it's 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 un, an uninsurable space? It's going to force people to come back. But the cost to do the controls, the cost to you know to be to really be a supplier. You know, I've got a I, we're working on a FedRAMP project. Guess what? FedRAMP for those of you who don't know, FedRAMP is the U.S. federal government's um, security controls 
package and process and authorization process where they really look through you know what you've done and, and make sure that it's fit for purpose within against a consistent set of controls if you want to sell into that market you must be this tall you must have these controls and you must be able to prove it what it means is is it is it i won't use the word discriminatory but is it slanted against smaller organizations that can't afford to do it yes but is there a need if an organization determines there's really a need as the us government has for a certain level of controls then that's what should be there and but as we talked about before about if private- an organization if if i am a i'm a buyer and i'm requiring this and the companies there's only one company that can do the thing i need then i should help bring them up to a particular level and that's part of the cost of doing business and that that cost then gets passed in we're always into yeah. the low cost. You know, this is America, home of the low cost everything or the, the desire for that's low it. cost everything. And that doesn't necessarily bode well in this space if you're demanding certain things or if you need certain things. All right. I'm glad you went there because I was going to challenge you on that because you're almost comparing private versus public spending and putting them on an equal plane. And to do that, you would have to make the argument that the U.S. government is an efficient spender of money. <laughs> that's not the case. Oh, I forgot we I wasn't know, on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know that as we come to as it comes to certain types of spending in that space, that they're willing, the government would be willing to spend more in or in order to get more down the line. Mm-hmm. That's fine. That doesn't happen in the private sector. That it's a race to the lowest yeah. cost. And as I think about this, I think we, we have to think about this in context that are we talking about a cyber issue? Yes. Does that mean we have to meet it with a cyber control? No. You can take out some of the impact of cyber events by stopping leaning out supply chains so much. You can still account for it for having multiple potential vendors in a given critical space so that you know that you're anticipating at some point one of these these vendors is going to get hit. It's inevitable. But all of those things raise the total cost of ownership and the total cost of running anything. If I have two of anything, sure. or if I have, you know, the reason that, you know, that that whole low cost mindset is what's driven the, the really lean supply chains. Um, so so did, I, think, I think the toughest part there though is like, and I just know I from 17 years of automotive, right? Like the purchasing teams, the purchasing teams would work with quality control and production control and risk management. Now they're working with the cyber teams as well to risk management of their suppliers. But to have purchasing also go in there and try to make sure that the supplier is being fiscally responsible with what they're spending their money on, suppliers never actually show their entire hand of, well, I actually did spend here. Look, look at the invoices. It was actually $2 million, right? No. And they'll probably say that it was four, regardless of what it was and how it raised the cost of everything. So there's that that piece of how do you manage that to make sure that if we're going to let the suppliers increase the cost to finish goods to us on the volume that we predicated over the year 2022 or 2023, one, are they being honest? And then two, is that even an appropriate amount of money to spend? And there's too many nuances there. But I do agree with you. If If everybody did agree, though, that the cost of having a cyber program, there is a cost to it. And if you have right. suppliers that are tier two and tier three that have never had a cyber program because they didn't even have a cyber person, right? Then there's clearly going to be cost added to that company. What is that cost? And is it proportional to the number of people they have, the size? Of, th- that's the little nuance that I don't think is distinguishable to say, you know, lying in the sand. And I, and I think if we're going to talk to those numbers too, we have to take a step back and stop putting the lens just on a single company or single vertical. And where is the financial pressure actually coming from to increase revenue all right so you've got oh, on shareholder one value street, one side yeah shareholder value we're talking about it's it's wall street but we're even talking about the cost of capital the ability to mm-hmm. borrow whether it be from a vc or traditional banks or issuing side any any of those elements and they all have metrics that they're using to track companies whether it's a you know return on assets or whatever their their go to their their metric du jour is is all incentivized by shrinking our costs to make it good and maximizing what we're selling it at. And ultimately, if you can't pass all of those costs on because the consumer is going to balk at it, we're kind of dead in the water. It, right. One one thing I would but I still have to that. buy the insurance that requires those controls, and I still have to do some kind of spend to get there. So it's this it's this paradox. It's it's creating quite the um, you know quite the cost benefit paradox or the even can I run as a business paradox. And Eric, one thing I would argue back though is, is, and this is where I think 
said OE that said that they wanted their suppliers to have cyber insurance. At the end of the day, threat actors kind of targeting the supply chain, realizing that it's follow the money trail. They're trying to impact the guy at the top. They're trying to impact the the OE or whoever it is that buys from all these said companies. So the smaller the company, especially a tier three or even a tier four, they realize these companies don't have a ton of money to be able to offer for a ransom engagement. But if you shut them down and they have no controls in place, the ability for them to get back up online takes longer, which means that the person at the top is the one that's hurt, right? And right. that's what they're trying to affect. So I think from a from a total cost of ownership model, right? When we say that our supply chain is, our suppliers are our most important asset at the same time we beat them up and want cost reductions from them every year. Um, I just had to throw that last part in for 17 years of automotive. I got the scars to prove it. Um, Clearly as a recipient part, of the cost demands. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, notice the thinning hairline. It's like the one time you won't see me with a hat, right? Um, that that part of it though- It's is, all automotive related? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's nothing to do with kids or anything else? <laughs> Yeah. Arguing with the two of up. us every few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that there's a cost ownership up there to understand that, like, if we're going to, if, if even if we're asking them to have cyber insurance or even if we're asking them to put a cyber program in place, there is a cost model to that. Now, yeah. I would also argue, though, that if you looked at some of those companies and says, said, is it worth the cyber insurance, right? Or is it worth taking that money and putting in controls and building a team to start with? Right. Like if you're looking for budget aspect, because I saw this argument start to come up in 2022, where a gentleman stood up at a kind of round table I was at and said, we're at the point where we're just going to say no, like you're you're increasing our cyber insurance by three times. Right. I got to ask for that budget in order to even get the cyber insurance. I got to put X, Y and Z in. It's like, what's you know, double edged sword here? Now I got to ask for this much budget. If I just got this to be able to put those controls in and that's going to satisfy the cyber insurance is management. Okay. With that. And that's the risk we're going to take. Right. Like, yeah. So in a, I, th this goes back to the ransomware question. Like there are companies out there and I, I'm going to go to product, but I'm not going to name names. There are products out there that companies are trying to create specific around ransomware and the ability of encryption outside of EDR and everything else that focus just on that because that's literally what was driving a lot of the cyber yeah. insurance. And we're right back right. at the USB-C cable where you create something that may be fine for today in a specific purpose, but in three years, that ransomware specific product, we'll, we will have all moved on. And my big investment in a ransomware well, product will be sitting there picking its nose, wondering where all it's, where all of its, uh, <laughs> all of its usefulness went. And this is, this is where continuing, this is just, Purely me thinking out loud here, but you know, I think as we look at the tier threes, tier fours, I think at some point that is we that we need to look at rather than shifting, we need to shift away from mandates and go figure it out. Thou shalt have cyber insurance because it's the panacea. It's not. Uh, it's that it's <laughs> fix everything and just push it down. Good luck. Go procure your own. I think at some point we need to look at doing this as more of providing, creating, for, at least within automotive or something. Create a services tier. Create a services tier that there's an incentive that you that we're going to plug you in as a partner, but we're going to partner with pick pick a general service technology provider that can help you provide some basic level of hygiene visibility into what's going on that thus helps everybody right within the, the whole supply chain. That's where I thought like some of the larger businesses, the OEs, right. I'm, I'm not going to say their names when I say OE original equipment providers. So like the general motors, Ford, Toyota, Except you, you name it. Name. <laughs> well, no, I was referring to what an OE is, but I'm not going to say specific names. So j just giving examples of OEs, but it, so you said service providers, they have the clout and the muscle to be able to go in and negotiate, right. And say, Hey, Here's, here's three that we work with. Here's three that we work with. And if you use these, here's just like a steel purchase program, right? To help level the playing field and cost. Because when you go down to those level threes and fours, those service providers and vendors, right? And I'm looking in the mirror, Brian, right? Come in and they're like, oh, the price is $5 million, right? And these companies are like, huh, right? They don't have the purchasing teams and the people to be able to go back and beat them up. Right. And I think that's where the OEs, if they said, hey, here's the three we work with, we've established 
you know, the General Motors rate. Here's what the metric is. Here's what the cost is. Full transparency. Fixed. But haven't yeah. you just created the same thing, the same kind of insurance formulary that we were talking about not wanting before? We vetted and 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 blessed these three things. Go buy from our buy list. Well, from the no, OE side, but it's the OE's risk. It's their risk with their supply chain. If they but want it's to the insurance that, company's risk too, because they're going to be paying out millions of dollars. But the insurance company is not getting me a better rate as a smaller firm. This is where, so Brian's making the argument that by leveraging the size of the OEs, that you create a fixed price model, full transparency down to the, the tier three, tier four, and allowing them, here's your catalog, what you can buy from full transparency. Here's what the prices are. And here's the different, it becomes a more menu driven yeah, decision. But I still struggle to see how that is any different than the panel of IR providers and lawyers that the insurance company gives you that says, here are the ones we've worked with and we've and the prices are negotiated down by 30% because we're buying on volume. Hey, guess what? It's just a VAR. They're just another yeah. VAR, but one you have to buy by. Yeah, but, but, but that's that, the difference. I, They're saying 30%, but 30% off what? Some list price? Like 30% off $2,000 versus 30% off $20. With the OE, it's, hey, the bolt cost us six cents. The bolt cost you six cents, right? And people would balk at that. And I've had people tell me I'm crazy. I'm like, you've never worked in full-blooded supply chain, right? You Like you... You're selling a SaaS solution, right? You, you're not producing a finished good. Even your overhead cost model is ridiculous, right? Like if, if you increase by 300% your revenue and sales, show me that you increase your staff by 300% and you invested in a ton of new capital investment. You did it. And if the OEs would come in and use their purchasing power, like I've even said, I might go back to the, I shouldn't call it the dark side, the automotive side, just to use that same formulation to be able to make these arguments to help the little guy. Well, I Anyways, think I got you, really excited there. It's yeah, clearly. But I think you've also, you're also in a world with tangible with tangible assets, but there's this significant portion of the world that's selling non-tangible things that have variable value or you know value in the eye of the beholder. And while that works in the manufacturing world or may work in the manufacturing world, I think there's a huge part of the population, a huge part of business that can't fall into that world. I can't resell a piece of a piece of software or a, or you know a a, a, a pizza delivery. Yeah, that in in the same way, yeah. And, and then you I, get I, into I, then you get into the point where over a little bit of time, you then say, "Oh, well, maybe I can take a little bit of a we'll call it a rebate, so not a kickback, is illegal, but a rebate for doing this, or I can take a better, even better price because I'm bringing all this." There's all of these natural progressions toward better revenue drivers. Back to what Eric said, what's driving this? better shareholder value. If I can make a little bit of refund or referral fees or things like that, what's to stop that from coming in? And now the transparency is blown. We see it in a lot of other fields. Yes, automotive may be able to, or manufacturing may be able to withstand that temptation, but I promise you just about every other field doesn't. See, in the right. one area where the cyber insurance companies have a somewhat of a leg up, right? is they get to see now who everybody is using, right? Because you, you've put that into, okay, we have an EDR in place and this is what we're using. At the end of the year, they can see statistically what companies were using, what EDRs mm -hmm. or what, you don't use even EDR, what, what solutions for what problems, mm -hmm. right? That they ask for. And then statistically at the end, they can see which ones had problems, which ones have repeat problems, et cetera. And then they can help drive, well, I shouldn't say help, then they drive, right? And this is where you said they're starting to dictate even products over just, you know, said name products or vendors over said solutions, right? Is why you're starting to see that happen more. But I, I feel like that goes against the grain then of, and it's one of the reasons why I put up this dark reading and I'm going to throw this out to you guys over the idea of how do you actually manage what your risk is, right? So like they're telling you, you got to have this and this is who we recommend, but you haven't seen the new technology that's out there. So you're telling us this is your recommended product, but cyber insurance companies aren't out there testing all the new stuff and looking at it and doing that. Well, they increasingly so, are. They, 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 so let's come back to that quite point in a minute, but go ahead. So I wanted to throw out to you guys. So I thought this was a really interesting read the other day. All right. And this was about rack space in the ransomware attack that they faced. And in the end, it ended up being a zero day vulnerability that had a patch that was put out there by Microsoft. And 
So they could have patched it, but they decided not to patch it. And the reason they didn't patch it was there was so much information out there about the first patch that they were worried that it would bring down all of their servers. I mean, they were pretty darn sure that if they did this, it was going to impact their entire customer base. Mm -hmm. So they put a few other controls in place and were waiting. I shouldn't say waiting, deciding when the best time to patch would be. But between that time and this time, that zero day vulnerability got hit and it brought everything offline. Right. And that's basically what the IR, the forensics team that came in and did the study. And there was an EDR that the, for a, excuse me, forensics team brought in. And that's what they realized. So you're, if you're the insurance company, ready? So Eric, you're rack space. Dan, you're the insurance company. You turn to Eric and say, hey, here's the, here's the protocols you put in place. And from a vulnerability and a patch management standpoint, you failed to patch. You agreed that you didn't patch. And Eric, you're saying, but if I did, I was shutting down my business. I was impacting all my customers. Insurance companies like, well, that's what ended up happening. So it's it's on you, right? But if yeah. if you're the insurance company and they did the patch, were you going to pay them for shutting to everybody down? No. Yep. I mean, you're this, you're, you're absolutely right. It's it, it's and this is why prescriptive answers are rarely it, rarely that easy. That you can't just say, well, the, well, the, the the regulation says that I must always patch, and unfortunately, we write contracts this way. We write, you know, you must you must patch within seven days. Well, maybe there's a case where seven days is it's an incomplete patch, or it's a you know, there's something that <laughs> that makes me not now yeah. in my in my role, and usually my conversations with either legal counsel or general counsel, um, you know, we'll talk through and have a reasonable, could we defend this? Can I pass the red face test and be able to defend right. my decision and say that this control, this particular mitigation, this alternative was equivalent? In the insurance space, which is, I still feel like they're looking for ways to get out of an unprofitable situation. I still feel it's way more about, did you do the checkbox we asked you to? And if not, pound sand. And this right. is a worry. Yeah. I mean, it's not fully unique to them. Oh, no, no, no. But that happens to be the topic of the I, day. I I very recently had something from a manufacturing organization. And one of the controls that was in there is essentially, thou shalt have only up-to-date operating systems. BS. You're in manufacturing too. You're going to push this control down. I know full well. You're still running Windows you're not XP. As well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, we do have controls around that, right? You air gap them. There's other things that they do need to be content. But the reality is certain parts of the business do run and can only run on some of those legacy operating systems. And that's where the importance of mitigating controls and the creativity that practitioners bring to the table and being able to cap that risk rather than trying to purely just check the box. Could you imagine the cost if we just went through and well, no, sorry, organization. It says thou shalt do this. We have to replace that. Yeah, but that's like a quarter of a million dollars. No, nope. it says it's, we got to yeah. replace it. Yeah, that's a million dollar microscope that we use three times a year for special needs that we have to have in place. And the return on investment on that micro microscope is like 20 years, but it's a super out of date XP operating system. You're not just going to go buy a $1.5 million microscope because it said that all this has to be update uh, up to date or running on. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you there. Totally agree. It, it impacts healthcare impacts, manufacturing. Like you got to look at your, go ahead. But to what extent then bringing this back to pushing recommendations or requirements on suppliers, at what point then do you say, all right, supplier extend the way that you support these. I'm running on a on a on a three year old version of your product. It's now end of life. It's now this, but I still demand security patches. It's a you know it's a capital investment it has a ten year usable life. I need you to be able to support that. You know how do we how do we balance out the stuff we we take on ourselves versus those that we that we keep the supplier on the hook. Yeah, I think about IoT. IoT devices is a um, is a microcosm of this at a very small scale, but it's I buy a thing and the software I have on it, I expect never 
especially the cheap, cheap ones, I expect never to see a soft security update or a software update. But if I buy a better product, I guess this is why you know why you buy certain versions of software or versions of soap cell phones. You expect longer updates, and now it's part of the sales cycle. But on a on a let's let's use a scope. Let's use a you know some kind of mass mass spectroscopy, um, you know scope. Millions and millions of dollars to do. You buy once, how long of a support do you demand from that supplier as part of the buy um, because you know that you're not going to replace it in 10 years? That's a interesting, really interesting, because that goes into even automotive embedded cybersecurity. How long can you say that once something goes even into a vehicle, right, even outside of manufacturing? Great question. Eric, what do you think? Are you talking about how do we... So, so going back to going back to the idea that you and you and Brian coalesced against me on that we can't force <laughs> our suppliers Brian off the turnbuckle <laughs> that we yeah that we can't force the suppliers to raise their game because they can't afford to do so. Well, the thing but, is, we but, but Eric, but we, if we're we buying don't... stuff from them. Shouldn't we have an expectation that it will be appropriately maintained through its usable life? I mean, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm really cheesed right now with Arlo, the company that does cameras. They, I bought a camera. It had seven days of free cloud recording when I bought it. This week, they announced. Guess what? Psych. Nope. No more. Because of security reasons, we're going to end this particular feature. But you can still buy our subscription, our new subscription that's no longer free, and um, and get the and get you know cloud recording. It's a little bit different, but it's you know it, I bought it expecting a particular usable life, or a particular feature would survive for a future for for usable life, and then it changes mid road. What kind of expectation should we have that this will get a 10 year, you know, this large scope to a 10 year set of support, including security patches and ways to do it without forklift upgrading the whole thing? So, so the including security patches, this will be really interesting because in automotive, suppliers have to have for all their tooling, their stamping, everything else, you have to be able to support 10 years past production. So, five years of production and, and then warranty parts. 10 years after. Sometimes you can negotiate that to five, but the OEs want 10 years after. Now, has cybersecurity been part of that as you get into more of the embedded products? Technically, it says you're still going to support for 10 years for what you're what you're providing. Right. Right. And I think this is where but it's going to become more and more interesting. That's as here. You get more and more embedded ECUs. But that's right here. Does that trickle down? Does that requirement trickle all the way down? To the guy who makes the brakes, when you when you engage in a in a, in a purchase well, so, of the so, brakes, and that's the one so, guy who makes the brakes. So the guy who makes the brakes, like I worked for a company, right? So the it, the company I previously worked for, Aishan, owned Advix, right? Advix was a very large brake manufacturer. Most of the brake manufacturers are tier ones, and you have tier two components that come into it. But the tier one is who's making the electronic control unit, right? That goes into that system, right? Which now that you have steer by wire and brake by wire, right? Which you know, companies like ZF, like CES going on right now out in out in Vegas, we're highlighting all the new steer by wire functions. And I'm sitting back here thinking everything I know now. And it's like, man, all these electronic control units now that are doing the steer by wire, right? It's like, if you're going to support that, what you, and you brought up a great point, Dan, for 10 years past production for any security flaws, then this goes to what, CISA and Jen Easterly were just hammering in the beginning of 2023, which is, uh, I don't know if I can pull this up, but tech companies should deploy software offerings that are secure by design. And they're going to push back even harder from a government standpoint that that whole secure by design that we're pushing way too many vulnerabilities out. And I think that's where automotive hopefully will take that curve of looking at things from a DFEMA and PFEMA when they design it in to say, we need to start looking at the design of our control units when we put them in there, because if we're going to be required for 10 years, right, this, this is where the always had a huge time negotiating with the likes of Amazon and everybody else, because all these software providers were like, no, we don't adhere to your contracts, but us as part suppliers with the ECUs combined, we had to adhere to them or else they were going to pull business from us. So I think, Eric, what are your thoughts? Like, how do you, how well, do you, I mean, I, I, I actually, I think we're, we're tackling three big different issues and trying to combine them into one and they're not combinable. 
Hey, <laughs> we're talking about the security of a product that's being generated. So as you talk about the ECU, the security around the code that's being embedded, and that's one thing. And that that's an area specifically within automotive that's starting to grow. So as we look at ISO 21434, there was a UN regulation that's coming out. We're starting to get our hands around that. That's one thing. The supportability going forward of a given product is another, because now we're talking about the viability of the downstream company that actually produced a component that goes into and ultimately yeah. flows up to the OE, which is a different risk decision. And then the third part of that is kind of the legacy equipment and controls that even as a tier one that we have internally that we need, you know, a CNC machine or something to actually produce some of the parts. So it's three different areas. You know, I, to me, the buyer, I, it's all one. Make a product that's supported, sure. right? So, I mean, yes, inside the company it is, but realize that to 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 the outside, it's you know, I bought a camera. I don't care what your internal problems are. That camera should survive, should be able to be supported for a particular period of time. Right, but the the same warranty policies. That but you're the, right, Eric. The, it's it's the same warranty policies that the car manufacturer sells to the consumer isn't the same warranty policy or the warranty that are put into the contracts with the suppliers. Now, one thing I was going to throw on, this goes back to the whole idea of insurance, car insurance, right? Would car insurance start to not pay out for, for issues related to cybersecurity for embedded cybersecurity? Should a car be taken over and crash into a wall? It's like, well, it's the driver's fault because well, it crashed into walls. No, no, no. Was it? If, at, the moment, didn't work. at the moment, there's I like, guess maybe not yet about hacking, but you can start to see the see the trend for now is that a, a crash that's initiated through automated driving is still the fault of the driver. So through why automated would driving, that not right. parallel? But but this isn't automated automated driving. Somebody comes in. Right. And takes over your braking system. No, right. But I'm saying we don't have a we I don't think anyone has a construct for separating those things today. So back to we didn't create the horse and buggy problem. Well, we didn't we didn't solve for the horse problem well enough yet in this space. We we have a we have a prescriptive control that says if a car crashes, it's assigned to the to the you know, there's no the, the other there, even the other no problem is state, the, 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 no the car zero the, fault on both sides. It's... But the, the car gets taken back by the OE right away for them to investigate. I mean, th this goes all the way back to like when Toyota was facing its issues where people said they had, you know, runaway Camrys and Priuses, et cetera. Right. And then trying to do the investigation and people were like, well, that's being done in a black box. We need to see this information. As of today, there's no if you, EDR or forensics, you know, tool inside the vehicle that's put, pulling all the log information, and put it together. Like for them to solve what happened to that car is a very lengthy process. And the car insurance companies aren't going to say, well, we're going to help you solve that problem today. Like car insurance has been figured out. I mean, it's, you can go out and get 10 quotes if you want it. Right. And it's like, brrr, they get it right back to you. Right. There's no checkbox. Like, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you get this control put in place? Would you see those things change for embedded security? And not just automotive, this goes to a lot of different embedded security. So I know I'm getting down a rabbit hole here of two different conversations, but I think those security policies will start to be dictated by what the security policies today are for, for the enterprise, right? It's like, well, these are the things they're able to do. And these are the ways they're not able to pay out, right? If cyber companies, insurance companies decide that they're going to start not paying out for different things. And there's a, there's a litany of things that are now being um, prescribed of why we would not pay out if I'm the, sh the insurance provider. If, as this list continues to grow, you got to imagine when it gets into embedded security and other things that you're buying, those same things are going to grow. And it just becomes a, at what point then is cyber insurance affordable for the small guy and the big guy, including the consumer? I don't think we get to that point. I don't think but so I, either. I think we, I think, I do think we can change the way we push down controls. I'm looking at, at one of the contracts that we had come across and, to, to one of the bigger Detroit OEs that sent it across and kudos. I like the way they they writ, they wrote this section, third parties providing goods or services necessary to sustain company X's business and production operations must take commercially reasonable steps to do the following. Yep. That's, and that's and been then a good phrase the tenets, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Here are the tenants. You figure out how you can implement those without us being prescriptive on how you're going to do it. Because what's even of even if you look at two sizable companies, in comparison, you know the OE versus us is still a huge difference. 
but the same thing on us versus a tier three or tier four, you know, what works and what's available to an OE is vastly different than what's available for me to put in. So by them allowing the freedom to, Hey, just meet these tenants, however you see fit and make it defensible. I appreciate Although, that. Although, and we'll close with this. Uh, although a, a, the person writing that contract, usually those, that wording comes from that with the bigger ability to litigate when it goes wrong, because it's, well, sure. you should have done it. And now we're going to, yeah, we're going to decide whether it was good enough or not, but that's, it allows you to do that. But you know, what benchmark will come, will companies use to determine right. what is commercially reasonable in their own organization and, you know, and meet those expectations. I think a lot of that comes from communication and that's business. That's again, un unfortunately, um, how much of that is going to continue to be pushed in through more prescriptive insurance right. rather than good business decisions, uh, you know, both risk-based decisions uh, in our own organization and for that of, you know, giving good for our supply or for the, for the people we supply. And that's, and I think that that's the advice we give to practitioners, put yourself in a defensible position, mm -hmm. look at your decision and make sure that you would be willing to, God forbid, be sitting up on the stand and be having to defend why you made that decision, why it was the right thing to meet both the objective of the customer and your business risk objective internally. And draw attention back to one of our earlier episodes this is the danger with with somebody with little experience trying to move into a more senior security decision making role and being able to determine what truly is a defensible position for the organization absolutely and on that note we're out of time brian eric as always a great discussion thank you so much and thanks to you the listener for being here um, we really appreciate it. We also appreciate your feedback and thoughts and ideas. Um, you can send them to us, feedback at greatsecuritydebate.net. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go to your podcast app. Go find us in audio for your drive. Now that more people are going to the office again, people are getting on the road and traveling, put us in your podcast, put us in your iPhone, and listen to us on the plane. Nothing better than a good chuckle at Brian's uh, automotive references while uh, while taking off in a big piece of uh, heavy... Uh, heavy airplane, heavy aviation machinery. Um, if you are listening and you want to see us, you want to see the facial expressions I make through the course, which are are, are vast and, and frequent, um, take us, take a look, youtube.com slash the at sign, uh, great uh, security, to, great security debate. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at security debate. And you can find all of our past episodes on our website, www.greatsecuritydebate.net. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you again soon on the next Great Security Debate.